So uh, thanks for having me along. I think I need to make the obligatory uh, GitHub joke. Um, we're, uh, we're very close to installing a Clippy uh, a, a app, a, a applet into, into GitHub. Uh, seriously though, I'm, I'm happy to talk about GitHub, but um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a small cog in a very big machine, so I don't know much about the acquisition details itself, but um, it's, a, it's very exciting news for us. Um, so what I'm going to be here to talk about today is uh, building private React galleries. Um, so who's using, uh, obviously I'd say most people here are front-end web developers. Um, so who's using uh, React today? Okay. And so I'll, I'll ask about the other part of the audience. Who's using Angular? Okay, so um, not quite even, but pretty close. So what I'm going to talk about here is, is building a, a component gallery for, for React, but it's actually uh, equally applicable to Angular development as well, um, provided you can produce a component and package it into an MP NPM file to reuse it. It should work equally as, as well. Um, I just chose React as my um, a tool of choice in this particular case. So I'm a program manager at Microsoft. I'm on the VSTS team, so we build VSTS. It's got source code control, build automation, but one of the features it's got is also the ability to host private package repositories, which is why I'm interested in this topic because our job on our team is to actually make it really easy for people to, to share code uh, across their organization. So, I mean, if you're, if you're building a, um, uh, an open source component, you would put it up on npm.js, no question. Um, so I'm not saying this is an alternative to npm.js, but if you've got private in-house code sharing requirements, this is an approach that you might take. So let me start by saying that, that Microsoft loves React. Um, the team that I work on, the, the broader VSTS team, uses React to build a fair chunk of its user interface. And in fact, Microsoft as a whole uh, is building uh, a lot of componentry on top of the React framework. And so if you look at uh, you know, the Office UI fabric, some of you may have come across that in the past, that's basically a set of uh, reusable components you can build to build applications that look, look at home as part of Office 365. And if you look at VSTS, this is one of our release management views within VSTS. You can see that we're reusing some of the components from the Office fabric. And then we've gone one step further and built some custom componentry, like some fairly rich visualizations. And so it's important for us to, to make that component reuse, reusable. So the way it works is that uh, we depend on React but for the VSTS team, we actually uh, sit on top of the Office Fabric UI toolkit as well. And so we've kind of got our own framework for dealing, for building out our own applications. And so what I'm going to do in this session is uh, just walk through and show some techniques for, for building React components and sharing them. But before I get into that, uh, I wanted to step back a little bit and explain you know, a, a trend that, I'll, that I'm seeing out there in the community at the moment. So who's heard of the phrase design system? A couple of people. Um, if, if, you, if, you work, if you are a graphic designer or you've worked with graphic designers um, or UX designers, it's probably a term that they're familiar with. And a lot of um, organizations are starting, to, particularly those that build um, applications for public consumption, are starting to think in terms of design systems. And the whole idea of a design system is to set up a sort of a framework or a way of thinking about your interaction with your application and apply that consistently across your product. Now, this is not something that Microsoft's come up with. Um, it's, it's something that's happening out there in the community, but we certainly think in terms of design systems as well. So the Office Fabric UI is an instantiation of a design system for Office, and we expose it in, su in such a way that other people can use it. But there are other examples as well. If you've heard of uh, the material design system from, from Google, that's another example of a design system. And of course, you know, one that's uh, pretty near and dear to Microsoft's heart is the Fluent design system, which is the design system we use to, to describe the interactivity of Windows applications. So design systems as a concept spans UI technologies. Um, and in fact, 
the, flu the Fluent Design System is a really good example because it's got uh, approaches for building headless applications like uh, smart speaker applications all the way up to augmented reality experiences. So, why? Well, the reason why people are starting to think about design systems is they want to drive some consistency in their user experience. They want to get some level of reuse. So having decided that they've got uh, some common elements that they want to use across their applications, they can uh, encode those inside reusable components. And that then leads on to productivity. So how do we do it? Well, one of the challenges we have in our, in our team is that uh, we're in this, uh, this it, con continual state of re changing the design system that we're using. And so if you look at VSTS today, you'll see UI patterns that come from a place before we even used React, before we picked up the Office Fabric UX. And you'll see the new design system. And so there's this transition period that you sit within. And really what you want to do is put some pressure to reduce the time that you spend in that transition period. And the way you do that is making your components firstly easy to create and reuse components so that your development teams can pick them up and adopt them quickly. So the team I'm on, we build an imprint private registry. So that's kind of a reason I'm interested in this space. And so I'll be using that for my demos, but I think the thing that I want you to take away from this is not just using VSTS or anything like that, is that if you're going to go down the path of building your own UI toolkit, you need to create a workflow that makes it easy for people to create and reuse those components. And so there's lots of different tools out there you could use to achieve this. I just happen to be using the tool that I'm most familiar with. So let's, uh, let's get to the code, almost. So. <laughs> Um, the moment you say that you're going to build a component in, whether it's Angular or React or something like that, you, 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 it's like you break into jail. All right? Suddenly you're dealing with a lot of different toolkits that you kind of need to navigate your way through. And so uh, who, who's heard of uh, the Create React app, NPM? So do you guys use that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, a few yeses and no's. So if your experience is like mine, I actually think it's a really cool tool. Like if you want to get started quickly, it's the way to go. Um, but it's not that great for building reusable components because what you have to do is you have to go create React app, then you need to eject. Right? <laughs> and then suddenly your package file just looks like it's a, a mile long with all the dependencies it's got. So it's not really optimized for building reusable components. And so I had to come up with a way that I could do this in a simple way and make it repeatable. That's like step one of that workflow. And so <clears throat> we need to think about what bootstrap we're going to use. Because personally, I don't think handwriting the React component with all the Webpack configuration file from scratch is a productive user, use of developer's time. And so I'm using NWB if you're not familiar with it. So NWB is actually a really awesome little uh, node package. And what I'm going to be building is uh, a component that represents one of these things on the web. So this is the, you know, the Microsoft employee badge. Um, the one on the screen is, there, is much prettier than mine. And um, what I'm going to do is use NWB to, to do the bootstrapping. Uh, and then uh, I won't focus too much on the React code since most React code looks the same. And then I'll get onto how you uh, publish and share that. So first thing you want to do obviously is install the NWB tool. And then you can use this command to create a React, compo React component. So NWB can create all sorts of t uh, scaffolded projects, but I'm using it for a React component. And my component that I'm creating is called Blue Badge. That's what we refer to these things at Microsoft. So then I jump into that, and it's going to build on top of the UI Fabric React. You know, I'm not going to build this thing from scratch. I'm going to build it. I'm going to pack it, and in theory, I could just publish that out there to, to NPM or any other registry. But I'm going to jump in, and I'm going to show you what this code actually looks like. And I just realized what tab I was missing here. So how 
Okay, so hopefully you, know, you can see that code okay now. So if I look at the uh, the code that was generated, there's actually a few things in here which uh, I've added. Um, this this code is going to be used a little bit more extensively than the, what the template creates by default. But what you get is you get a package file which has a bunch of pre-built scripts for bundling and running a test server. The thing I really like about this template is that it generates the code not just for my component, which is what I've got here, where I'm reusing the Office React Fabric UI, but it also creates a demo project. And so if you're going to create a process for creating reusable components, in that same project you want to make it easy for that developer to, to test that component. You don't want to have to make them go through their entire development pipeline to see that that change in a downstream consumer. And so I can jump into the command line here and I can just say npm start. And what it's going to do is it's going to run Webpack and it's going to spin up a server and then I can uh, spin that up in a website and I'll see my really awesome component. There we go. So that's working fine. So it's just a simple, simple component at this point. So then what I need to figure out is how I'm going to publish this thing. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm a developer, you know, and I don't care too much about, you know, having a repeatable workflow, I might just pack this right here and then and actually push it to a private registry. But there are things that I want to make sure happen every single time I publish an updated version of the component because if you're building a a process where this component is going to be used across multiple applications, you want to have some sort of quality check, some sort of repeatable build process. So I've got this source code host up in version control. I'm using VSDS. Git would work, uh, GitHub would work fine for this as well. Um, so where the source code is hosted is not that important in this particular case. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a build process. So every single time a change occurs here, it's going to trigger a build. And when I run that build, I'm going to do a couple of really simple things. I've got a little gulp script here. Now this gulp script, what it does is just update the package version every, every single time it builds. I'm just doing a single incrementer in this case, but you can use semantic versioning if you wanted to, and there are ways of doing that. But a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. And then I'm just calling out to NWB to build a component. And I'm actually going to invoke this build process as part of a CI pipeline. I'm also testing the component as well. And I actually capture the test results and store them so I can see the test results over time with the various components. So the way it works is that inside uh, VSTS here, I've got a build definition set up. Once again, you could use any CI system to do this. Um, it so happens to be the one that I use. And so <coughs> this build process has, has a couple of different steps. Obviously, when we're doing a build, we restore the packages so we can do a build. And then I run my gulp file, and I'm hard coding the, or sorry, I'm passing in the version number that I want to be stamped onto the component that I'm producing. So the, the gulp file that I've got actually has the, the logic in there to capture that. And then because that runs the test process as well, I get a, a JUnit test result file on the build agent. And so we've got a way of ingesting test result files and publishing them. And when I run this build, you'll see that. And then once I've got that package all done, I basically publish that into a private feed. And then finally, and this is where I think you know a, a registry becomes a gallery, I've got a process for not only just storing the package, but also deploying that uh, component onto a website so you could actually interact with it. It was probably more interesting if it was an interactive component. And so if you look at the uh, source code for this, you'll see that I've got a, a template file here. This is a um, this is actually an Azure resource group template. And the idea here is that I'm saying create a website. When I deploy this template, create a website. So if I create a new component, I get a new website created that hosts that component and I can have sort of a whole bunch of demo code there. And I stitch that into my registry so I can sort of have that, that gallery of components which I can then jump into and see how they actually behave. So let's queue this build. 
So, launch that. So this build is going to run, and I'm not going to wait for it to finish. Um, just to see as it kicks off. So what it's doing here is obviously restoring the packages. It'll go through each of those steps, and when it's finished, you know, a website will be created with this reusable component. But the component itself would have also been uh, published to a registry. So let me jump back. That's what I'm doing now. Okay. So I'll jump over, and so. Here is um, some components I published previously. So this is our, um, our NPM feed. And so you can see that I've got my component there, which is the, the blue badge. And so the idea there, there is that I can jump into that component in my registry, um, and hopefully the network's behaving itself. Well done, I'm sorry. <laughs> there we go. So it's coming. That was quick. <laughs> so there's the, the actual package version that I've got. And you can see here over on the home page, if I click on that, it actually navigates over to a website that was created as part of that build process. So the idea there is that I've got my private registry, and then as part of my publishing process, it's actually instantiating a version of that component I can interact with if I wanted to. So how do we consume these components? So when you, when you use NPM, it automatically goes to the public registry, and that works fine. But NPM has the ability to be pointed at a private registry. And if you have already use NPM for private components, you're probably pretty familiar with that. So the way it works in our case is that, uh, <coughs> you know, let's, let's assume that I'm using, some, using something like uh, Create React app to bootstrap a new application. I would set that up. I would add the registry to my npm rc file. And then I'm going to install my component and then use it. Now, adding the registry to your npm rc file requires authentication in the case of um, uh, you know, private registries. And so we've got some documentation here just to make that a little bit easier. If I jump across here, you can see connect to feed and go to NPM, and you can see that that's the, what you paste into your NPM RC file. And because I'm using a Mac, I would actually then have to generate a credential that I put into my NPM RC file in the root of my, my user directory. If you're using Windows, you can actually just use this little tool that actually bootstraps that authentication process for you. Uh, it's got a, a secure way of doing that. And so if I've got that all set up and running, so here's my Create React app bootstrap application. I can just go npm install, blue badge, save dev. And hopefully that runs quickly. <laughs> it's getting there. Dead time. Okay, so I will let that continue running and then I'll come back to it. And I'll talk a little bit about, so you guys have all seen how you consume a React component. I don't need to teach you how to do that. Um, what happens in the way I've got this set up is that uh, inside this registry, I've got the, the design system package feed. But that design system package feed Wow, it's, there we go, let me try that again. Okay, it's installed now, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump in and I'm going to start hacking on this code. So I've got my blue badge component installed. I'm going to go to app.js and I'm just going to import my component. There we go. And then I'll drop back into the command prompt just to make sure that's all working. It should spin up a web server for me. 
Okay, so I've got my component, my new component running inside a fresh React application, so it's fairly easy to set up and consume. So the idea here is that um, that end-to-end -end pipeline, that's, that's your workflow. So we can, we can talk a little bit later about how we can actually speed that process up. Okay, let's jump back. Okay, so let's talk about some tips and tricks. So the first tip and trick are, is around how you manage private registries. So what I've got here, I'll, I'll try to be fairly generic, but I'm gonna, I don't, don't want to move across the screen too far, but what I've got here is, you know, obviously I've got a source code repository with my component in it. I've got a build process that's building that source code. Now, when that build process runs, it actually consumes the packages from a private feed. Now, if I look at my web browser here, I look at the build definition, you can see that when I uh, restore the packages, I'm actually pulling those packages from an externals feed. And the externals feed, if I look at it, actually contains a whole bunch of external packages, including the package that I created. The way this is set up is that, and this is a requirement for NPM, is that because NPM can only point to one feed, it can actually also, through that, that private feed, pull to NPMJS. But I'm also consuming the design system into that package feed as well. And so, this is what I would probably consider a best practice in that you have a, a feed that uh, is useful for consuming all of your external dependencies, but you don't publish your components back into that same feed. Instead, you put all of your published components into you know, your design system feed or whatever you want to do it, and then consume that back through the externals feed so that developers on your team that are consuming components just have to point at one feed, which is a requirement for NPM. And that works pretty well. So, you know, if you're doing that manually all the time, it takes a little bit of time to set up. But what we can actually do is speed this process up by having a, a Git repo that has all of the necessary components pre-built. And so, if I jump in and I go to my uh, code tab here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to import a registry, import a repository from GitHub. which has some starter code. And I'll call this uh, yellow badge. So what this does is it takes that bootstrap code that I've got there, that I've set up previously, and it just basically imports it. And all I need to do is go through and change a couple of key values like the package name. It won't take long. There we go. And so now all I need to do is just update the package name. You could use something like Yeoman or something like that to do this as well. But I find this is generally as quick. There we go. Change the package name. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a build definition for this. So uh, what have I got here? some reason the window isn't showing up the way I expected. So I'll go and set up a build and that build template that I was using previously, I've actually just saved that off so I can actually reuse it. So when I go in here to set up my build, I just use that pre-built template and I just call this build yellow badge. I pointed at a build queue and it needs a repository. These are the repositories that we could use. In this case, yellow badge. Save in queue and in run. And in not too much time, I'll actually have a yellow badge component published to my feed. So, you know, in, in the space of a couple of minutes, I've actually stood up a whole new component build pipeline that I can just then go and hack on the source code. And when you're building a reusable uh, component pipelines, that's really what you want to achieve. You know, you want to make sure you've got that sort of one, two, three workflow going so that 
as you're building out your design system and capturing, re capturing these reusable components, you've got a quick way of doing it. So uh, I've got a couple of minutes left. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, otherwise, thanks very much for your time. Questions? I just somehow missed the part. So do you get a new uh, Git repository for every component or do you combine a lot of them in one repository? Uh, so that's actually a good question. It's, it's actually not actually necessary for the approach uh, that I've used here. Like you could just spit out another subdirectory with the components in it. And so you could build multiple components at once out of the one repository. That would just be a matter of um, you know, repeating that process multiple times for each component. So you can have multiple builds hanging off the one repository. Um, or you could just build them all as one big long build. Um, NWB, the bootstrapper, the way it works is it favours... Uh, it favours creating like a single repository. Uh, but it's not, not strictly necessary. Uh, so this is just using um, Webpack. So I'll look at the, I'll show you the, the source code. So if you go into, so NWB is not a Microsoft thing. Um, so it's an open source tool that I decided to pick up and use for this because it does exactly what I want. Um, but if I look at the source code, you'll see that for my CSS inputs here, so there's my CSS file, I'm just using taking advantage of Webpack to basically import that CSS file and then I can refer to it. So it's basically whatever Webpack supports in this particular case. So it's nothing specific to the, the end of work workflow. When you showed your real deployment pipeline, there was a notion of rings. So how does that work with a component library? Notion of rings. Yeah, you, oh, the you one within deployment <laughs> rings. Yeah. Uh, really good question. Okay, so um, there are a bunch of things I didn't show, uh, which are kind of interesting. So, um, rings, the rings model. I'm doing a, talk, a lightning talk tomorrow where I talk about how VSTS is deployed. So, if you want to understand our deployment model, I can give you like a five minute overview on that tomorrow, or just grab me in the hallway. But the way that this would apply to package management is that we actually have this this neat feature. Um, where you can create views. And so I could go in here, I could say, um, you know, I've published this package to my local view, but I can actually promote it to like pre-release and release views. And so your developers could actually, you know, only consume from the release view of the feed instead of, and just get this just a different feed URL. So if I jump over to my design system, I can filter by view, so I've got a release view here and there's nothing in it. But if I go back to my, my local here, I can select this and promote it into another view. Hopefully the UI comes up nice and quickly. I think I've got some network issues. Torrents, stop, Donald, and torrents. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, the idea here is that you would um, publish into your local view, and then you would m sort of, when, you, when you're happy with the quality of that component, you might then promote it to another view. Now, if you've got a really rock solid testing pipeline, there's no reason why you can't publish into the release view directly. Um, the, the rings model that I had on the, the initial slide um, was about the actual internal Microsoft VSTS deployment pipeline. Um, not so much package management. Uh, that's about it with the time. Please grab Mitch and ask him a lot of questions. You have the oppor opportunity. So thank you.